All warfare is based on deception. There's a particular book I want to recommend to you, from which the opener is read from. This little gem right here, just so you can see it. It's an ancient book, very, very old book about warfare, perhaps the first real book on strategic warfare. And what's interesting, to put it mildly, about this book is how, to this very day, this is pretty much the principal book of understanding the basics of strategic warfare. But more than that, the lessons the book teaches are used across business circles, across different economic teachings. This is politics, because this is a book of basically human strategy in adversity. It is expressed, of course, through physical warfare and its descriptions, but Basically, you could say that when humans conflict, whether physically violent or with words or whatever, the core of it becomes deception in some way. We seek advantages over the other. And one of the easiest ways to do this is through deception and trickery. How often do we resort to this? But the important parts of this book are where it talks about how and when to make war. If you want to talk, look at what's wrong with our international war policy, read this book. Read it and look at the sections on when and how and why to make war and how to do so. And you will see that we basically flagrantly violate every principle in here. War should be short, quick, with meaningfully achievable objectives that are realistic in nature. They should have definitive beginnings and ends with goals that are understood. There should be a prominent chain of command with a high morale based upon a powerful command. Oh, by the way, he talks a lot about the maintenance of standing armies and how they destroy the economy, including a particular passage talking about how the central lands of the place keeping this army will lose seven-tenths of their wealth to this upkeep. And that how the government itself, due to the repairs on broken down equipment, which he talks about, you know, lances and everything, but just replace that with cruise missiles, tanks, and whatever. And it, he notes it will take about 60% of the budget to maintain this army. And it's interesting to note that his numbers aren't that far off for right now. If you look at our total budget and how much of it goes into the military industrial complex for maintenance and upkeep of our army, his words, written before, you know, fucking Christ, literally, still hold true. But not just in military, as I said, does his words hold true. If you flip through the book, if you read the various points he makes about the cohesiveness of soldiers and commanders, of the chain of command, you can see how this applies to business and employers and employees as easily as it does to soldiers and commanders. I have worked in so many places and seen it where his talk about how a general should lead when not followed, basically, through the economic lens of being a boss, when it's not followed, you see it, his words come true. There's anarchy and dissonance. There's disloyalty and there's corruption. There's even, as he would put it, sedition and treason, which basically, you know, stealing from the workplace or whatever, disloyalty, because the person in charge is not following the right way to command people, because make no mistake, if you are a manager, a boss of people, you are a commander. That's, you know, may not be in war, but if you're in a high-stress job, especially like something, it's a reason why, you know, stock traders and economists read the book, <laughs> because high-stress jobs can be very much like combat in certain ways. It puts a high level of stress on you. You have to have that hair trigger response. Like if you're in a kitchen, a high-volume kitchen, you're going to have days where you are having to strategize your entire day, plan a formula for dealing with the onslaught of your enemies, the customers in this case. And anyone in a kitchen, I'm pretty sure, can back that up, that feeling of you against the world, you and a small band of loyal soldiers against the onslaught of the endless hordes of the enemy, and how you need to prepare and strategize for their coming. We would spend whole mornings and 
one job I worked at, planning for a huge event that was happening, strategizing around what would happen if something went wrong, contingency plans, because you screw up a big banquet dinner for like 250 people at a wedding, you're fucked. And you know what? Being an avid reader of this particular book has helped me personally in many cases where you can look at it and say, hmm, I'm in a particularly bad situation here. Okay, so taking some advice from this, I need to account for myself and then account for what's going on. I need to plan around my strengths, figure out what the least difficult positions of the problem are versus my most capable abilities and then apply them where they match up to solve the problem on a good start. Basically begin your offensive at the point you are strongest and they are weakest. In this case, solve your problem by applying your greatest strengths to the problem's least complicated variables. Just one lesson you can take from it, and it is archaically written to a point, and it is a bit cumbersome, but at the same time, if you get yourself a good version of it, and don't mind digging in for a little while, you'll basically find yourself reading what is pretty much the preeminent document on human conflict and strategy. And I would really love to point out before I close this recommendation out that repeatedly through this book he actually talks about how war is bad. How war is a last resort thing that should be made quick and efficient. And he does these strategies and talks about war and how to wage it effectively for the purpose of ending it. Not that he wishes to prolong war or enjoys war but that war waged quickly, effectively, and with useful and effective tactics can be less bloody, less violent overall, and more quickly resolved to the benefit of everyone. Because, as he notes, war is the worst form of diplomacy. It is the least effective means of communication. And make no mistake, war is a form of diplomacy. It is a method of negotiation through violence. And, as he notes, it should be avoided at all costs. But if you are to conflict with somebody, take a note from this and do it in the most effective, efficient, and least harmful way possible so that everybody can move to recovery. Because the idea is that war is bad for the state, the people. The people suffer when war happens. This is always true. It is the people, the regular people, that suffer the brunt of it. And it is for their sake that we should wage war effectively, efficiently, and as bloodlessly as we can. And to apply that to other realms of life, like economics and everything, everyone should take a page from this and note that we should achieve what we want in life efficiently, effectively, and without animosity towards the other people around us. Do not take more than what you need. Do not conquer unnecessarily. Do not aggress against people who do you no wrong. There's a point where he says, if not in danger, do not fight. Take that one to heart. 